So, Father, cause us to preach Jesus in his name. Amen. Someone uh, recently sent me this uh, footage of an actual counseling session. And I want to show it to you because I think if we pay close attention, it would revolutionize the way we do ministries and indeed our lives. Uh, Dr. Switzer? Uh, yes, C come in. I'm just, just washing my hands. Uh, I'm Catherine Bigman. Janet Carlisle referred me. Oh, yes. Uh, you are being a very delight in the box. Yes. Yes, that's me. <laughs> Should I lay down? Oh, no, no, no. We don't, we don't do that anymore. Just, just have a seat. And uh, let, let me uh, tell you a, a bit about our, our billing. I, um, I charge $5 for the, for the first five minutes. And, and then absolutely nothing after that. How, how, how does that sound? <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> Too good to be true, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I can I can almost guarantee you that that our session won't last the full uh, the full five minutes. Now, um, <laughs> we don't do any insurance billing, so you would either have to pay in in cash or by check. <clears throat> wow. Okay. And uh, and I I don't make change. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and go. <clears throat> go. Well, tell what? me, tell me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No, no, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, if, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. <laughs> stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you... you, you you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> yes. Then stop it! I, I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since childhood. No, no, childhood. no. No, we, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop. So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good go. Well, it's only been... It's only been three minutes, so that will be um, uh, three dollars. Uh, I only have a five, so. Well, I, I don't, I don't make change. Then I, I guess I'll take the full five minutes. Fine. All right. Well, what other uh, problems would you, would you like to address? <clears throat> Whew, uh, I'm bulimic. I stick my fingers down my throat. Stop it! <laughs> some kind? Don't, don't do that. But I, I'm compelled to. My mom used to call me... No, Daddy. no, no. No, no we, did, we don't go there. But I've been having this dream. No, we don't go there either. But my horoscope did say... We definitely don't go there. Just, <laughs> just stop it. But what, what else? 
Well, I have self-destructive relationships with men. Stop it! <laughs> you you want to be with a man, don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yes. Well, then stop it. <laughs> don't be such a big baby. <laughs> I wash my hands a lot. That's all right. It is? I, I wash my hands all the time. There's a lot of germs out there. Uh -huh. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't worry about that one. I'm afraid to drive. Well, stop it! <laughs> I, I love that video, because I really think that's what most people think real counseling really is. And certainly what church is, or what church is uh, supposed to be. You come to church to find out what's good and what's bad. Washing your hands up, th that's fine, that's okay. Uh, being afraid of being buried alive in a box, uh, bad personal relationships, bulimia, that's bad. And, and then after the pastor tells you what's good and what's bad, after he tells you what's bad, he says, stop it, stop it, stop it. Now if I were to say that in Hebrew, I'd use the word Shabbat. That's where we get the word Sabbath. For 1,500 years, the Lord God told the Israelites to stop it. And they only got worse. You see, I think we think our will is okay. So all we need is some more knowledge of good and evil. And so we come to church thinking, okay, pastor, give me some of that knowledge of good and evil. Gosh, if only there was like a tree from which I could just pluck it. But there isn't, so all I got is you. So tell me. How much should I give? How long should I pray? Uh, should I be a Republican or a Democrat? Should I spank my kids or put them in time out? Give me some of that knowledge of good. Give me the law and tell me to stop it. In our scripture for the morning, Jesus tells a woman, John 8, verse 11, to literally go and from the now sin no more. In other words, Stop it. And it appears that she does. But normally, stop it doesn't work so well. Uh, the woman in the video, she came to see Bob Newhart because she was afraid. She was afraid of being buried in a box. Ironically, just her fear of the box was the box. She couldn't go home. She couldn't drive, she couldn't rest. And Bob Newhart tells her to stop it. Yet the more he tells her to stop it, the more she does it, the more she gets afraid, the more she's buried alive in a box. Sometimes, 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 people actually don't want to stop it. They don't like to stop it. They're, they're compelled to not stop it. And so we switch tactics. I'm afraid to drive. Well, stop it! <laughs> How are you going to get around? Get in the car and drive, you, you kook! Stop it! You stop it! You stop it! <sighs> what's, what's the problem, Kathy? I don't like this. I don't like this therapy at all. You're just telling me to stop it. And, and, you, and you, don't, you don't like that? No, I don't. <laughs> So you think we're, we're moving too fast, is that it? Yes. Yes, I do. All right, then let me, uh, let me uh, give you ten words that I, I think will uh, clear everything up for you. Uh, you want to you get a pad and a pencil for this one? All right. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, here are the ten words. Stop it or I'll bury you alive in a box! So the counselor tried to control her fear of being buried alive in a box with more fear of being buried alive in a box. Hebrews 2.15 tells us that Jesus came to deliver all those who through fear of death, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong bondage. Let me paraphrase. Jesus came to deliver us from the fear of death. Sin is Bondage to the fear of death. Sin is faithlessness. It's not trusting 
God. So it's fearing death. Therefore, to say stop sinning is to say stop being afraid of death. Surrendering control is to say stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. And to say stop sinning or else, or else you'll be damned to hell, is to say stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box or you'll be buried alive forever in a box. <clears throat> stop being afraid of death or you'll die. Now, that, that may be true. That may be true. But my point is that that does not help you to stop it. It doesn't cause you to repent. And if we think it does, we just bury each other deeper in boxes. I have three friends that were literally buried alive in boxes, closed in coffins and satanic rituals, two of them with corpses. You see, Satan wants us to be terrified of being buried alive in a box. So we'll be terrified of surrendering control. So we'll be terrified to trust and so that he can control us through fear. And thus we'll be buried in a box long before our bodies are ever buried in a box. Dead. Dead hearts. Well, in John 8, Jesus tells a woman to, to stop it, and, and I think she does. John 8 um, follows John 6 and 7, amazingly. And you, you remember uh, the last several months, we've looked at John 6 and 7 and the incredibly challenging topic of free will and the idea that we are predestined to have a good free will. Most Americans seem to think we already have a good free will, and you see, if that's the case, all we really need is some more knowledge of good and evil. All we really need is more laws, lists, rules, and we will stop it. And if that doesn't happen, our will happens to be weak, well, then we'll fortify it with incentives and threats. Incentives and threats, which actually strengthen our will, for what we end up doing is repressing our will with more of our will. So we say stuff like this, stop being greedy. Why? So you can get streets of gold in heaven. Or stop fearing death. Because if you don't, you'll really die in hell. Stop being afraid of dying a little or be afraid of dying a lot. Believe God loves you. Believe God loves you unconditionally or he'll hate you forever. Have faith. No more fear. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. And we don't. You see, maybe we don't need a, a new list and more threats. A new Ten Commandments, a new set of rules, new Ten Words. Maybe we don't need to fortify our old will. Maybe we need a new will. Maybe we need a new heart. And I'm not talking about Bob Newhart. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Okay, John chapter 8. Uh, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple, his, his father's house. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught. She's been caught in the, the very act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him. Deuteronomy chapter 6, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. They're trying to trap him. Uh, trap him by either doing something that was totally against the, the, the mercy that he exhibited or doing something that he would be arrested for by Rome because only a Rome was allowed to put a man to, to the death. This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they, they went away, 
one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with a woman standing or, or placed before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. Stop it. Stop sinning. And we want to ask, or what? Jesus does not mention an or what. And yet this entire thing is a full-blown crisis, full-blown crisis for everyone involved. Crisis from the Greek word krisis, which is normally translated judgment. Everybody is caught in judgment. Everybody is caught. My uh, friend Sharon Hirsch, part of our church, you know, gave uh, an incredible message on this uh, a few years ago about how everybody in this story is caught. And the gift it is to be caught. You see, if the problem is our will, we won't will to come to Jesus. We'll have to be caught. And this woman is caught. The punishment for her sin was death by stoning. Stoning, it was where you would take a person and a mob would gather around them and throw stones at them until they died. Perhaps one stone would hit you on the shoulder and bruise your shoulder. Another stone might hit your finger, break your finger. Another stone might shatter your, your shin. Another stone, another stone, another stone, until finally one stone would crush your skull and the mob would gather around you, reviling you, kicking you, and covering you with spit. Death by stoning. And Jesus does not dispute that sentence. It's scripture. Deuteronomy 22. The punishment, the, the punishment for two people having sex before marriage. Do you know what it is in Deuteronomy? Marriage. Forever. At least until death do you part. Uh, the punishment for uh, two ma a married person having sex outside of their marriage, the punishment for that in Deuteronomy is death, but the form of death is not specified. However, the punishment for someone betrothed having sex outside of marriage is very specific. Death by stoning. For both. Which makes you wonder where the, the guy is, but you see, this woman was betrothed, and she was probably quite young. Ironically, it's, it's the very crime that Jesus' mother would have been accused of, but imagine how she feels. She's, she's really just a girl, and perhaps for the very first time in her life, she offered that most sacred and holy part of herself to a man. She was caught, stripped naked, such longing, such shame, now probably stripped naked, lying in the dirt before an angry mob and the man. The man who people proclaim is the great prophet. She must be thinking to herself, I'm being buried alive in a box. Why do people commit adultery? I mean, isn't it really because they long for life? They long for communion? They long for for joy, for passion. They long for life and they're afraid of death, afraid they'll miss some life when they are buried alive in a box. And what happens when people do commit adultery? Well, first, they hurt the one that they're promised to. And that is not an abstract hurt, that's a real hurt. That's, that's literally a broken heart. They hurt the one that they're promised to, and secondly, they begin to hurt themselves. They begin to bury themselves alive in a box. And so out of fear of being buried alive in a box, they bury themselves even deeper in a box, adultery. To walk away from 
faithfulness is to walk into faithlessness. To walk away from the covenant is to walk into the curse. To walk away from the truth and bury yourself in lies is to bury yourself in lies, darkness, and death. To walk away from the truth is to walk away from Jesus. He is the truth. Well, Jesus doesn't argue the, the crime, the adulterer's caught. He, he doesn't argue the crime, even the punishment. He just says, well, let him who is without sin then be the first one to throw a stone at her. You see, the law prescribes that the, the witness cast the, the first stone. Now, why would someone want to witness this crime? Why would someone want to watch this crime? I mean, your people, right? I mean, if, if they wanted to watch this crime, would they be a witness without sin? Not also guilty of the crime. And why would these fellows want to, to punish this sin? I mean, you see, perhaps they were kind of like jealous of this sin, in which case they were already committing the very same sin in their hearts, which is the very worst place to commit it. You know, when my, my kids were little, I, I, I would punish, punish them, but... but but I, I really didn't want to punish them. It wasn't about, I didn't like punishing them. Because I wasn't jealous over what they were being punished for. Coleman used to eat dirt. He'd sit in the backyard to eat dirt. I'd catch him with dirt all over his face. He'd try to deny it and everything. And I'd say, Coleman, you're eating dirt. Now stop it! <laughs> stop it or what? <laughs> stop it or you'll be full of dirt! Stop it! I wasn't jealous of Coleman thinking, if he gets to eat dirt, I should really get to eat, eat some dirt. I should stop this. I better punish him. No, I, I might force him to stop, but only in the hope that one day he would choose to stop. In, order, in other words, I was hoping that one day his taste would change, his desire would change, his will would change, and it has. It has. He's, he's 15 now, and, and I just say to him, hey, Coleman, buddy, you're free. Go in the backyard. You can eat all the dirt you want. And you know what? He chooses pizza. I choose pizza, Dad. You see, that is a good choice made in freedom. For he's free, but he doesn't want to choose it. A good choice made in freedom. But as long as he secretly wants to eat dirt, the choice really isn't free. And he's not free. Well, anyway, when my sister was little, she used to eat manure because my dad bought these big piles of it in order to fertilize the yard. So I'd go outside, and she's, like, eating poop, and I'd be like, Lydia, stop it! Stop it! Stop eating, the, stop eating that crap! Stop it or what? Well, stop eating crap or you'll have to eat crap! You see, the crime is its own worst punishment. Listen to Julian of Norwich. She wrote this. Sin is the sharpest scourge that any chosen soul can be struck with. It is a scourge which lashes men and women so hard and batters them and destroys them so completely in their own eyes that they think they only deserve to sink down into hell. But when the touch of the Holy Ghost brings contrition, it turns the bitterness into hope of God's mercy. And then their wounds begin to heal. And so all shame will be turned into glory and into greater glory. And I am sure by what I feel myself that the more every well-natured soul sees this in the kind and generous love of God, the more loath he is to sin. In other words, if we really see sin, we'll hate sin. And we will have compassion for sinners. You see, I don't think uh, we have compassion for sinners because secretly we are jealous of their sins. But if we really see sin and hate sin, we will not be at all interested in punishing sinners. Unless, of course, that punishment helps free sinners from their sin. 
In other words, get out of the box. But you don't free people from the fear of being buried alive in a box with more fear of being buried alive in a box. Unless, of course, that helps them somehow to see that they are already buried alive in a box. St. Paul tells us that God sent the law, which is the knowledge of good and evil, God sent the law to increase the trespass, that sin might become sinful beyond measure. That's Romans chapter 5 verse 20. God sent the law so we could see that we are already buried alive in a box, already dead in our trespasses and sins. You see, the law doesn't fix sin. It exposes sin. The law doesn't fix our will. It exposes our will. The law doesn't give us the power to stop it. It reveals that we can't. We can't fix our will with our will. Our flesh with our flesh. Our fear with our fear. The law and threats don't fix our will, but actually tempt our will to become its very own judge and savior, to become God, to become sinful, beyond measure. These scribes and Pharisees in Jerusalem are about to become, or perhaps already are, sinful beyond measure. Who do they think they are? And who are they really? Pay close attention. This is Ezekiel 16. Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, these guys. And when I passed by you and saw you weltering in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. And when I passed by you again and looked upon you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I plighted my troth to you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord God, and you became mine. These men holding the stones have been betrothed to the Lord. And now he is standing in front of them and they are in bed with the principalities and powers of darkness. They have become accusers. Accuser is another title for Satan. They really aren't accusing this girl, by the way. They're accusing Jesus. Why? Because they hate him and they hate his mercy. Soon they will hand him over to the beast, the empire of Rome, and they will use their knowledge of good and evil to nail their Lord and bridegroom to the tree of shame on the hill of the skull. They are the unfaithful betrothed, whom the law prescribes to be stoned. They're fixing to stone themselves. Jesus bends down and he writes in the dust. Perhaps he wrote the law, thou shalt love. But they hated love. They hated mercy. And you see, God is love. 100% love. Grace. Burning hot. Eternal grace. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone, says Jesus, and they're caught just like the girl is caught. They drop their stones and walk away. They walk away. They walk away. Jesus did not ask them to walk away. Does Jesus love them any less than this girl at his feet? No, they are his chosen people. They are his bride. They are the ones that he came to redeem, and they walk away in order to hide in a box. They walk away from Jesus, the way, the truth, the life, the light, the reason. If you walk away from the way, where are you walking to? Lostness. 
If you walk away from the truth, what are you walking into? Lies. If you walk away from the life, what are you walking into? Death. If you walk away from the light, where are you walking? Into the darkness. If you walk away from the reason, you are going insane. They are hiding themselves in outer darkness. Hell. They came to Jesus for judgment. And the measure they gave was the measure they got. But Jesus loves them. Oh, he loves them. Adores them. Just as he loves the girl at his feet, this adulteress, this daughter of Sodom. Jesus loves Jerusalem every bit as much as he loves her. Listen to what the Lord says to Jerusalem, his bride, at the end of Ezekiel 16. Listen to this. I will restore their fortunes, Jerusalem, both the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters and the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters, and I will restore your own fortunes in the midst of them that you may bear your disgrace. Was not your sister Sodom a byword in your mouth in the day of your pride, before your wickedness was uncovered? Yea, thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, who have despised the oath in breaking the covenant. Yet I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish with you an everlasting covenant. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when I take your sisters and give them to you as daughters that you may remember and be confounded when I forgive you all that you have done, says the Lord God. He's saying, my bride, I will strip you of your arrogance, your bad will. I will strip you of your arrogance. How? By having mercy on your sister, Sodom and Samaria. You see, Christ's mercy upon the adulterous woman is judgment on the scribes and the Pharisees. It's already stripping them of their pride. Soon he will hang on the cross having mercy on all creation, and that is judgment upon Jerusalem, his bride, us. It strips Jerusalem of her pride, and in one generation, Jerusalem is literally stripped to the dust of the ground. Not one stone left on top of another. But it's not because he doesn't love her. No, it's just the opposite. He wants her to lay at his feet like this woman of dust lays at his feet now, stripped of arrogance, ready to surrender to love and to become love. Well, the woman has been caught. The scribes and the Pharisees are being caught, and we're caught by love. Romans 2, you have no excuse, O oh man, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. Here's another way of saying it, but of the tree of the knowledge of uh, good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day you eat of it, you will surely die. You see, sin is such a deep problem. I think we eat of it constantly and we don't even know it. We come to church in order to eat of it, eat of the tree and judge ourselves, judge our neighbors, take the place of the judge who is God himself. Pastor, give me some knowledge so I can judge myself and judge others and make myself in God's image so I can cover my sin, repress my sin and stop it. Help me bury my fear with more fear and construct an illusion that I'm okay, that I'm not already buried alive in a box. We try to fix sin with sin. Flesh with flesh. Fear with fear. Our will with our will. And so, of course, we don't stop it. We enhance it. And so Jesus reveals that we all deserve to be stoned. It's just like the great philosopher Bob Dylan once said, they'll stone you when you're trying to be good. 
They'll stone you just like they said they would. They'll stone you when you're trying to go home. They'll stone you when you're there all alone. Oh, I would not feel so all alone. Everybody must get stoned. See, according to the law, the problem is, that the, isn't, is not that this woman must get stoned. The problem is that everybody must get stoned. And yet that means nobody has any right to throw stones. Nobody. Except one body. Jesus. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Blamo! <laughs> okay, now, let's just be honest, okay? That, that's what we really expect. I mean, even if we've read the story, that's still what we, that's, that, that, I think that is really what we expect. Um, that when Jesus said, I don't condemn you, what he really meant, what he really meant was, I don't condemn you now. But I'm coming back a second time. And if you haven't stopped sinning, then I'll kick your ass. I'll stone the living daylights out of you, and I will bury you alive in a box because it is Judgment Day. Schwarzenegger, Judgment Day. And so what do we do? We come to church afraid of death. Expecting to be healed through even more fear of, of death. Expecting the pastor to say, have faith, no fear, or else you can be buried alive in a box forever by God. Well, now listen. I hope you're thinking this and asking this question. But fear of God is, is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, Scripture says, even commands it in places, that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And check this out. Jesus is wisdom, the Logos. And this woman at Jesus' feet, she's afraid. At last, she is afraid of the right thing. Jesus said it. There's only one of whom you must be afraid, that you must fear. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is Jesus. And Jesus is love. Fear is the beginning of love. but not the end. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. When she was thrown at the, at the feet of Jesus, she was afraid. And now he asks her only one thing. Where are they? Where are your accusers? Is there no one to condemn you? You see, he asked her to only see that there is no one left to condemn her. There is now only one to fear, and that one is the Lord himself. He looks her in the eye and he says, neither do I condemn you. I do not condemn you. He does not say, I do not condemn you yet. He does not say, I do not condemn you if. This is not simply a second chance. This is not simply a grace period. This is grace period. This is not a threat of what could be. This is what eternally is. This is I am. This is the heart of God. This is Jesus, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And he says, I do not condemn you from the now, from the now. I do not condemn you now, from now. Stop. Stop burying yourself alive in a box. Stop burying us in a box. Sin no more. That's not a request. It's the word of God. It's the word that spoke 
creation into existence. It's the word spoken into the dust that made Adam. You know, people speculate about why Jesus drew in the dust, and, and some say maybe he was listing the sins of the Pharisees. I don't think so, because Scripture tells us love keeps no record of wrong. Some say, well, maybe he was writing the law, and I think maybe that really could be. Some say perhaps it was Jeremiah 17 that adulterous Israel would be written into the dust of the earth just as this young woman was placed in the dust of the earth at Jesus' feet. But I'd like to think that Jesus, the word of God and the breath of God, bent down to write in the dust of the ground the way God bent down to breathe into the dust of the ground when he made me, when he made you, when he made Adam. See, God is fixing to make someone in his image. He's fixing to give her a new will a new heart, himself, the heart of God. I do not condemn you, period. And some will say, well, what about judgment? That is judgment. John 5, 22, the Father judges no one and has given all judgment to the Son. John 8, 15, Jesus says, I judge no one. Remember, Jesus is the judge who judges by not judging. His judgment is absolute, burning hot, fiery, and eternal grace. And if you don't like that, you're screwed. I mean, you really are. Because ultimately, that's all there is grace. And that means you can only hide in nowhere and nothing and darkness and lies and death and even that comes to an end in a lake of fire and divinity. You see, his judgment is grace. But make no mistake, it really, really, really is judgment. John 3, 19, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Those scribes and those Pharisees, they hated God's judgment on that woman and so they condemned themselves to hell. And they will stay in hell both in this life and in that which is to come for as long as they hate God's judgment. Hell is hating God's judgment, grace. And what about the woman? I think she passed through judgment, for she's seen the light shining in the dark. I bet she's at least starting to love the light. She loves Jesus. In other words, she loves God's judgment. She loves love. So when love says, stop it, she wants to. She trusts the judgment of love. Another way to say it is she has faith in grace. She has a new heart. Jesus' new heart. You see, we think judgment is to determine if we have a good heart. God already knows that we have a bad heart. Judgment is how he gives us his heart. And some will say, well, what about justice? Someone got hurt. Yeah, God got hurt. All sin is adultery committed against God. Jesus on the cross is his broken heart on public display. So like it or not, every time you lie, you break the heart of truth. Every time you choose darkness, you crucify the light, your bridegroom. Every time you reject love, you cast his heart into the pit. Some will say, well, what about the law? I mean, the wages of sin is death. Yes, absolutely. You see, that woman was caught. The scribes and the Pharisees uh, were caught. We are caught. And the moment Jesus said, I do not condemn you, he was caught. Behold, the 
Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world because he wants to. He was caught. You see, he planned to be caught from the foundation of the earth, from the moment Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, let us make man in our own image, the image of love. On the tree we call the cross, Jesus bears the sin of this woman caught in the act of adultery. He bears the sin of all Israel. He bears the sin of the entire world. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world because he wants to. He's the will of God, the heart of God, the judgment of God. And on the cross he bears our punishment and descends into our box. That woman laying naked in the dust but encased in shame, she must have felt like she was buried alive in a box. And I would imagine that her eyes were closed. They were closed until she heard a word. Woman, where are they? She opened her eyes and realized that Jesus, the man Jesus, was in her box. He chose to be with her in that place. Very soon, folks would forget about her and they'd come for him because he chose to be in the box with her. Of the three friends that I know of that were buried alive in a box, each is part of a satanic ritual. Each of them got out, or I should say their, their hearts got out when they realized that Jesus was in the same box. I was with two of them at the time in, in prayer on separate occasions when God revealed it. And in visions, they opened their eyes in absolute terror to see Jesus in their box. I honestly think those two experiences may be the most dramatic experiences of my life, and I only witnessed them vicariously. One of them screamed in joy, my blood is on his robes. The other one saw things too amazing and too wonderful for me to explain here in the time that we have. But Jesus revealed his love in their place of shame and perfect love cast out fear. You know, the earth is a box. Your body will be buried in that box. Your flesh, your stone heart. And Jesus will bear it to destruction. But right now, he gives you himself. He is the resurrection and the life. And though we die, yet we shall live forever. On the night that he was given up, he took bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body given to you. Take and eat. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This is the new covenant in my blood. The life is in the blood. The new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. In the morning, he would go to the hill and they would pound him to the tree where he would bear the sins of an entire creation. Do you understand that you are the woman caught in the act of adultery? You are Israel, the Israel of God, caught in the act of adultery. You are the bride of Christ preparing to be cleansed. You're caught. You are sinful beyond measure. But you know, God is not disillusioned with your sin. For he never had any illusions about your sin. Only you did. And that was the box.
So you're lying there, caught there, caught here, and he says, now, sweetheart, look, I do not condemn you. Now stop. Rest. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Dark cups are wine, light cups are juice. They're both the grace of God. Just sit there in the dust and listen to Jesus sing to you.
You see, we don't come here every week to get the ten words, to get more laws, to get more commandments, to get more rules, to get more knowledge about what's good and what's bad. I mean, that can be helpful, but you can read a book, you can go to a class. We come here because we've been caught. And we need to lay in the dust at the feet of Jesus and hear his word as he bends down and he says to us, I don't condemn you. From the now, go and sin no more. Stop. Stop burying us alive in a box. And if you're tempted to pick up uh, one of these, tempted to pick up sin, just remember that, that if, we, if, if we do that, everybody must get stoned. Testify, Justin. One, two, one, two, trying to be good they'll stone you just like they said they would they'll stone you when you're trying to go home they'll stone you when you're there all alone but i would not feel so all alone everybody everybody must get stoned